So, we can now talk look into random noises, you know we can look into random noises like I said that footfall noises right in a in a corridor or somewhere people are going and supposing I have a corridor and I have a studio below or I have some reading room below. Now, these are random noises generally libraries you do not want noise to you do not want noise is generated within the source you do not want it to come back, but do also do not want it to go to the next level. So, it is a structure bound footfall noise is a typical random structure bound noise right. Now, I cannot I what I do in this case we do what is called floating construction floating construction. Now, what is a floating construction because one way is to put a carpet onto the floor or linoleum flooring you know resilient flooring floor itself should be resilient like like you know a timber flooring like that you see in this particular room or in a badminton court in a badminton court you know they do when they are smashing or doing something they actually stamp it. So, if it is on a first floor or a dancing floor you know dancing floor western dancing, dancing floor and so on. So, that is actually would have wooden tiles or some kind of resilient flooring itself right. So, this resilient flooring acts almost like same thing as the isolator acts like isolator and when it becomes when it becomes I mean let slightly more then we do what we call floating construction. So, a floating construction is something of this kind a floating construction looks like this. So, a floating construction will look like this you know I will have a resilient I will have resilient finish resilient finish at the top oh I will have resilient finish at the top a resilient finish at the top the mass then of course, plaster or ceiling or whatever it is. Now, this could be heavy because structure bound noise is never structure bound noise alone it also generates air bound noise that is what we have seen earlier then machi machines or similar kind of thing it also cause you know it causes vibration or imparts vibration to the floor or the structure, but does impart you know causes also airborne noise also. So, you would like to trans stop that airborne noise also going down therefore, this is mass law we have seen that 18 log m right remember that mass law we talked about T l is equals to 18 log m plus whatever f and all that right. So, mass per unit area is important. So, you put it heavy right and you want to you know if you if you go on increasing the mass then you have a problem. Supposing there is airborne noise is increasing. So, resilient cushion actually resilient finish or resilient cushion actually uh, reduces down the or increases you know reduces the transmittability delta d b becomes higher 1 by tau tau it reduces that. The mass reduces the airborne noise transmission loss property. So, you got to combine both of them and when airborne noise is very heavy you may not have you cannot go on increasing the floor thickness. So, what do you do use double lift system increase lift. So, you see you put it put in between a timber or similar sort of resilient material connector that is put a button two buttons or similar kind of material today one might have uh, fiber fiber you know fiber reinforced material polymer and so on resilience property should be there it, sh it should have property like able to you know come back to its original position like spring does. So, that kind of property store the energy and release it store the energy and release it. So, you might have timber battens resilient layer then this connector then the slab and it might be it might be on a quilt resilient again on a resilient layer. So, raft timber raft at the top a timber flooring right and then this is the battens and then there is a resilient cushion and then the slab. Now, here the mass can be medium need not be very heavy because now it is double lift it is double lift it is double lift. So, it can be it can be it can be you know it can be uh, light relatively medium. So, slab again resilient layer and this is floating screed or something floating screed similarly slab here can be heavy and with a resilient backing backing floor covering with resilient backing etcetera etcetera and leveling screed or something of that kind. So, essentially the principle is that if you want to reduce down the airborne noise together with the random uh, structure bone noise 
you have a resilient layer at the top or you have a rough kind of thing one leaf supported with resilient material you can't put steel here if you put the steel it will transmit and then you have a resilient cushion then the heavy mass or you can have simply resilient flooring and heavy mass or medium mass etc you can use those combinations you understand the principle a resilient material at the top of the flooring level ensures that random noises will not be transmitted structural noises and the mass ensures that airborne noise would be reduced if mass you can't increase make double leap that's the idea that's the idea right so this is another another examples of some floating construction right if it is light light here quite light put something up there and so on so mass you can decide if it is light material you can use if it is uh, double leaf wall then double leaf as we have seen the double leaf wall actually transmission loss is higher so that's it that's it actually uh, okay so strategy wise i must strategy wise for airborne noise and structure borne noise if it is first we have discussed earlier that if it is within the source source is within that room then you, you you know you put on absorbers if the source is in the next room or outside this room either it would be structure bond or it will be air bond or combinations usually you know air bond or combination of structure and air bond the strategies then we looked into if i know the frequency in case of structure bond noise what i do i put an isolator if i don't know the frequencies random footfall noise or utensils falling or something of that kind then i treat it in different way right so we have actually noise criteria curves as we call it how much because we have said that earlier i said earlier that dba remember we talked in terms of dba so permissible noises are quite defined quite often defined in terms of dba particularly external scenario for example you know like ngt suggest in residential area should not be more than some 40 or 45 db during night time 50 db in day time or something of that kind so there are criteria they are very gross dba level coming from different sources but there can be other kind of there can be other kind of uh, uh, you know other kind of uh, uh, within space i can have other kind of criteria frequency dependent earlier we talked of dba is largely a gross one single value combined all db frequencies but you can have for example nc20 noise criteria curve 20 represents very quiet scenario and it takes into account of the sensitivity of the ear and you know that ear is less sensitive at low frequency you can tolerate more remember that equal loudness level contour so nc20 is somewhere like this right very quiet 20 to 25 and nc70 is somewhere there so you can you know there are there is one is somewhat uh, stringent curve another is less stringent curve so these are called noise criteria curves noise criteria curves are basically gives you your acceptable noise level as a function of frequency acceptable db level as a function of frequency so nc 20 to 25 is very quiet so you want very quiet scenario you must maintain nc 20 to 25 within the space now we are talking of inside the space 30 to 35 is just quiet 40 to 45 moderately noisy and 50 to 55 noisy and over 55 very noisy so somewhere acceptability would be there somewhere acceptability will be there right uh, in the sense that you would specify within the classroom you know noise ambient noise level should follow nc 35 car so it's frequency dependent now it's frequency dependent right so if i know this these are known these are standardized actually right uh, some of them are as i said the stiffer ones are one of them are stringent one is less stringent all right so that dotted lines are it tolerates more so less stringent delta uh, the dark lines are all stringent curves so this is given this is known acceptable values internationally known now supposing this is i know nc 
is my requirement. It specified that within this room I require MC45. And I also know the noise level outside, outside noise level, the load if I may call it. This is my requirement. This is the load. Then how much insulation I need is the difference. At different, every frequency, how much insulation I need, I know. How much insulation I need at different frequency, I know. And, and then I can use mass law if it is all airborne noise. So, I know that, you know, I said how much was it? Transmission loss, is, loss was equals to 18 log m plus 12 log f minus 25. So, at every frequency, how much my transmission loss value I can find out? Because T L is equals to, T L is equals to, you know, you remember 18 log m plus 12 log f minus 25. So, at, you know, the how much T L I, I, I require, I know from here. If it is through insulation, I am trying to design the insulation, right. Obviously, whatever comes in a part of it will be absorbed in the system also. That I might neglect at the, for the time being, but uh, because that would always make it things a little bit more conservative. So, m I can calculate out from this, because at every f corresponding n c 45, this difference, this is the, this is the actual outside load, this is what I should have, this should be equals to the transmission loss value and at a given frequency. So, I know the value of frequency m at every frequency I can find out, I can find out m. Take the highest value of m, take the highest value of m that will be the design mass per unit area. If you are able to provide with the mass by thickness of the you know wall or ceiling or roof whatever it is, then it is fine, but if you are not able to do it go for double leaf wall go for double leaf wall, right. So, this diagram allows us to actually determine the insulation required and then calculate based on whatever principle I talked about, right. So, that is what it is, okay. So, before going to exposure, you see first of all, I think I, I there is no slide here, but uh, I like to add any of these issues as we have seen in thermal issue as well, we have seen that it starts from the urban planning stage. And uh, here also, I might have told you the external noise control that you do zoning, right? Try to keep the noise. Now, similar thing you can do inside the building also. So, you can classify space, spaces can be classified, spaces can be classified. First of all, noise generating. Let me call this as NG noise generating and I might have, I might have uh, uh, something called not noise generating. NNG. So, I can classify the spaces as NG and NNG. Some source, some space generate noise, some space do not generate noise. I can now define two types of room again, noise tolerating and not noise tolerating, right. So, noise, noise tolerating and not noise tolerating, you know, noise tolerating and not noise tolerating, okay. Let me use some other color. So, noise tolerating. N T and not noise tolerating, let me put it as another color, not noise tolerating. So, you see I can have a room which is noise generating and noise tolerating. I can have noise generating and not noise tolerating. So, N N T so, this will give me combinations, four types of spaces. A space should be either, you know, it has to be NG, NG, NT, 
n g n n t and the other one is non non not noise generating n t and not noise generating n n t right and not tolerating also does not generate now let us see noise generating and also noise tolerating right uh, a kind of a student's canteen it would generate noise but they don't mind the noise being you know, it's all noisy it can be i mean it's suspected it's fine there's no problem so such a space is noise generating and it tolerates the noise also uh, noise generating but not noise tolerating a classroom obviously you know whatever is going on here is a noise for another room right a classroom is such kind of thing and then noise not noise generating but it can tolerate noise it doesn't generate noise but it can tolerate noise right so something like a uh, of course the last one i'll give a store room for example usually it doesn't generate noise but it tolerates also you know it it tolerates noise you know it doesn't matter a store room whether there's a there's a, it does, doesn't generate but noise comes who cares it's it's not a problem so not not not, not noise generating and not noise tolerating uh, um, operation theater right operation theater does not generate any noise very quietly people are working or, or even 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 you know like uh, um, these days you may not have that kind of thing but good old days you used to have a server room of the or rather you know, mainframe computer and then uh, the, uh, there will be all kind of uh, um, uh, uh, mainframe or or you know even a computer room some supposing you know computer lab it doesn't generate noise but doesn't tolerate also doesn't tolerate also. so now how how do you go about it to segregate this room in the room planning itself so this planning stage itself there's a kind of strategy that i am talking of see not not noise generating and noise tolerating this kind of spaces can go anywhere you don't need any buffer but if something is not noise tolerating noise generating one space which is noise generating and not noise tolerating generates but doesn't tolerate two of such space can cannot come together because you know one is here so compatibility of this this is very compatible it can go anywhere doesn't generate can tolerate the one doesn't who generates they cannot go any time with next to next with noise tolerating so all that i am trying to say is while doing space planning proximity of spaces these ideas can be kept in mind and then if you can't separate them i mean there is a reason to keep them as much as possible close put a buffer in between and this will act always as buffer or some fire or such places you know this, this will act always as buffer something of that kind you put in so in the planning stage within the building itself you can segregate areas or locate these areas in such a manner that you can cut down on your insulation requirement and you know absorption in those requirement provided you have planned it accordingly so but then remember noise planning is not the only planning you are planning for traffic movement planning for thermal issues might be because you want to something you don't want to heat up too much don't keep towards the uh, radiation receiving side west side or something of that kind in the afternoon and uh, so all this is all together there are traffic private traffic pro, you know traffic movement is very important in functional buildings so it is all together but this can also be taken into account while planning that must be kept in mind right so strategy should be first first for internal noise control identify the type of spaces plan them accordingly and possible sources then you identify structure bond or uh, uh, structure bond or or uh, um, what do you call uh, uh, airborne noise and then all, all this planning you do and then you can decide on this one just one more point related to this exposure condition is very important from health point of view for example you know 115 db for 15 minutes 0 hour 15 minutes can 
create same damage as 85 dB in 60 nano. So, exposure levels are given, lower noise level can be tolerated, but this is an industrial situation. You would not be somebody would not be subjected to 85 dB all the time, that is usually would not be the case, right? That will not be the case. So, uh, you know, 85 dB, uh, 150 dB, these are equivalent. So, these are the exposure level, these are exposure level as it is called, these are exposure level as it is called. So, T is the permissible exposure time that is given from various health consideration in national building code or similar bodies and it will be given as actual exposure time C right ex, ex, actual exposure time C. So, sum during all the day time and T is a permissible exposure time P is a, at that given dB right permissible. So, for example, you know what is given is it is for example, if you are subjected to 115 dB for 10 minutes. So, it will be 10 divided by 15 and then you are exposed to 85 dB let us say for 10 hours plus 10 divided by 16. So, this is the kind of cumulative damage we are talking of. So, sigma C i by T i this should be some sigma T i by C i by T i should be less than 1 because in industrial situation or many other situations may be one is exposure to different dB levels at different for different durations. C i is the actual exposure divided by T i is the permissible exposure at a given dB level. So, if you are exposed to 80 dB let us say for 7 hours and per permissible is let us say 20 hours or whatever it is the fraction of damage would be given by that. Sum total of all the damages must be less than equals to 1. So, that is that is the thing you know. So, that 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 is basically the exposure you know this kind of cumulative damage we use in many other places also. So, sigma T i C i by T i actually that should have been a bracket should be less than y where C i is the actual exposure time T i is the permissible exposure time for a i th level of i th you know some i th value which corresponds to a dB value. So, i th dB level and sum it up for all the dB levels that should be less than 1 then you are safe if it is more than 1 that means it is not so safe right it is not so safe. So, that is that is what it is that is what it is. So, what if I sum up the strategies for uh, internal noise we must first do the planning part of it. So, first step is planning as I just mentioned also identify planning and identify the kind, kind of sources that you have identify the possible sources. And in the planning stage itself you know you can you can actually take care of it quite a bit. Second stage is you find out what the source is, is it within that room? Within room absorbers, absorption coming from the next room. So, from outside from another space or outside or outside you know you will have two cases airborne or structure bone. If it is airborne then obviously, mass law insulation right or double leaf wall. So, airborne means mass law double leaf wall structure bound means if it is known frequency then isolation if it is random noise may go to floating construction or combine both airborne noise etcetera etcetera resilient flooring resilient cushion in a floating construction and so on. So, that is the strategy of control of noise within the space and we have noise criteria curve which says specifies how much noise the space can tolerate based on that you can design the whole system. Okay. So, I think with that we by and large finish our discussion on noise control we will look into auditorium design next. Week.